Yeah, I mean, actually, you talked about the, the fools who would say, um, how could you understand Shakespeare without reading it? Um, there's quite a, lot, quite a lot of fools who would say that, actually, including quite a lot of people at the RSC, because Shakespeare was writing for primarily oral and aural culture, so the audience were very, very attuned to, to listening, and Shakespeare notated something purely for actors. He didn't ever imagine that very many people would read what he wrote. So, um, you know, I agree with the broad thrust of your argument, but I think on the particular case of Shakespeare, it's complete opposite of your example of Brahms, of, of people coming prepared to the piece. Uh, Shakespeare really didn't ever intend those plays to be read very widely at all. They were to be primarily heard. Um, anyway, that wasn't my spiel. This is my spiel. Um, I studied English literature at Bristol University from 1984 to 1987, and although that's nearly 30 years ago now, the English course was remarkably old-fashioned, even for its own time. The English department, I hope there's nobody here from the English department, almost to a person were acolytes of F.R. Levis and set out to teach us the great tradition. Over three years, we read the canon of English literature in chronological order from Chaucer in year one, term one, through to the zenith of D.H. Lawrence in year three, term three. We read hundreds of thousands of words every week, and we were stuffing literature into our young hard drives. We were being taught to appreciate literature and to write essays that expressed our appreciation. We weren't taught to be particularly critical. How could you be too critical of anything that had already earned its place in the great tradition? And we were certainly not being taught, this was the biggest sin of sins, to deconstruct any of those individual works or that great tradition. Of course, even then, particularly then maybe, the outside forces were there threatening our studies, and they were enormous voices from the working class, from women, non-Europeans, gays, all sorts of others, were claiming that the great tradition was written and maintained by white men of independent means, and that there were equal or maybe even richer narratives that came from other experiences. And there was also a vocabulary of critical theory, forbidden on pain of derision from our department, that could occasionally be slipped through the bars of our scholarly cell. We were being educated to join this exclusive club, one in which Shakespeare conversed with Milton, who had a chat with Wordsworth, who had a few words with George Eliot, who had a talk with Tennyson, and then had a little natter with Conrad. It was not expected that we ourselves would or could write anything great but that our appreciation of literature would allow us to join the club and to sit at the side tables while the conversation between all those great masters was happening at the high table. It was in many ways a very silly and a very snobbish idea of literature, and having graduated, I could see that the great tradition needed to be broadened and deepened to include other cultures, classes, genders, sexualities, popular culture, and to apply all of those tools of critical theory, which was so much more incisive than the vagaries of literary appreciation, which we were taught, and that this is what departments, other departments than ours, were doing. But I think there were some wrong turns made in doing this, and something was lost. The initial impulse wasn't, it wasn't, I think, initially to say that the existing canon was bad or irrelevant to dismiss the work of Keats or Austen or the two Eliots, T.S. and George, but to broaden the canon and the vocabulary we used to talk about it. But this became a wildly ambitious project. If our three years were packed just working our way through that established great tradition, lightly appreciating as we went along, how could other undergraduates broaden this reading and analysis without ditching much of the reading of what stripped of all that snobbery and aura, was still, I would argue, 
maybe objectively and certainly palpably great literature. So in retrospect, I'm on the whole pleased that I spent three years reading my way through that great tradition. However circumspect, can circumspect, that would be interesting. <laughs> However circumspect and critical I am of the premise of that tradition. It's a basic roadmap that I studied and that I can spend a subsequent, hopefully long lifetime supplementing, challenging, criticizing, and yeah, appreciating. Because the alternative of a kind of modular system of studies, a few weeks of Victorian Gothic fiction here and a few weeks of steampunk there and maybe a few weeks of post-colonial poetry there, is in danger of leaving students with a dehistoricized, patchy sense of the map. It's a road, but it's one that's illuminated only here and there by the odd lightning flash. Seems to me that the early era period of postmodernism in the arts, probably the late 70s, early 80s, widely drew on those great traditions to pastiche and cut them up, scribble over, put back together again, because those initial wave of postmodern visual artists, composers, writers, had an education that in many ways resembled my own. But broadly speaking, it seems to me that the works of a more late postmodernism largely dispense with that relationship with works of the past. Reflecting something that's happened in the wider culture, they exist in the present entirely, making no reference to anything other than themselves and the works that exist around them. Rather like 24-hour rolling news, much of the art of the last 10 years exists in a state of constant, rapid motion without actually going anywhere. There's no memory of the past and there's little thought of the future. Grand narratives are dead, history is dead. So we're present, we're now, forever, now. <laughs> and in my game, which is playwriting, playwrights only a couple of decades ago saw themselves in a conversation and an argument with the past. Somebody like Edward Bond, who's a, as distinct and as radical as any playwright in post-war British theatre, is still in constant and sometimes angry dialogue with the theatre of the Greeks and Shakespeare as he attempts to get to the heart of our lives as moderns. But many newer playwrights now see themselves as having nothing to do with the past. They don't want to see or to read old plays by dead people. Why should they? They're making something new and for now. So they only have the work of their contemporaries and the immediate culture around them to refer to. But my sense is that we need to historicize the present. We need to see that it wasn't always thus, and it won't always be thus, and that each age has found new forms to express the newness of our experience. I think by losing our sense of the past through a canon, through a big narrative, we lose the ability to ask the bigger questions of now, to be aware that form must be constantly challenged and tested to create new work. The work produced in this bubble of the now is, it seems to me, nearly always conservative, in theme and form with a small c. <clears throat> I'm not calling for a return to FR or Queenie Levis, but a way out of that bubble of the now is something that I think we need to find and we need to find pretty fast. Fantastic. Thank you. I'd like to talk about the now for a moment. I used to teach at Royal Holloway University, which is a very fine academic university, and there was a feeling at the end of the first year that the, the 50 uh, very well brought up students knew how to sort of do Shankarian theory in a kind of muddled way, but couldn't keep a pulse. 
And there's a whole different kind of nowness and literacy in being able to keep a pulse. And um, let's, you, I was going to ask you, do you think poems should be learned from heart? But you've talked about critique and context and history. What about the visceral and present quality of learning your art? Yeah. Um, yeah, God, it seems such an awful thing to say because it's something that Michael Gove said. <laughs> that's why but I'm yeah, asking you. I know, when I was, I, I, well, I, even, even when I was at school, it was, uh, it was thought to be too old-fashioned to um, learn poetry by heart, but I, I wanted to work in the theatre, so I went to a very, very old drama teacher. My mum got an extra cleaning job and paid for me to go to this very, very old person who uh, got me to learn Shakespeare and poetry and stuff by heart. And yeah, and I think that visceral sense of a, of, of a pulse and, and, and feeling the thought, that thought and feeling are connected in, in, in verse and in prose um, is, yeah, I think, I mean, that's been much more directly informed my writing than the literary appreciation mm. that um, I was taught at university.